Reprise du débat, continuing debate. The Honourable Member for Barry Innisville. Well, thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker, and uh, I too am very glad to uh, rise on this motion of privilege uh, that's uh, in front of the House today. And I want to thank uh, my other colleagues, uh, the, my colleague from Caribou, Prince George, and Branford Brant, for uh, their speeches today. I know. I've been working with uh, the colleague from Brantford Brant on the Ethics Committee. Uh, this issue actually came before the Ethics Committee uh, almost a year ago, Mr. Speaker, that we started looking into the SDTC scandal. And uh, even then, we just started scratching the surface of what was to come and what has led us to this point here today. But uh, I want to go back August 12, 2020, just over four years ago. Mr. Speaker, uh, of course, the world, uh, we were dealing with uh, the uncertainty of COVID at that time. Um, I know the House uh, was uh, operating in the Committee of the Whole, and I, I remember I, I gave a speech. Uh, we were just starting at that time to really understand the extent and the scope of some of the sole source contracting that was going on. In particular, uh, you know, there was an issue uh, with CMHC at the time, Frank Bayless with ventilators. Uh, we were seeing this, this uh, level of insider cronyism start to take its root within the Liberal Party and uh, sole source contracts related to COVID uh, matters, uh, COVID equipment, etc., was being given to uh, Liberal connected insiders. And I want to go back to what I said uh, over four years ago, August 12th, 2020. And I said, um, at that time, I was just sitting right over there where uh, the, the Honourable Member from Edmonton Manning is right now. I said at the time that the sponsorship scandal will look like a speck of sand in a desert when this is all over. And when this is all over, the Prime Minister and the Finance Minister at the time, Bill Morneau, will be just fine. I said, I have a question to ask on behalf of every Canadian before more stories surface, because they will. How many more liberal connected friends, families, and insiders have had their palms greased and have personally financially gained from this pandemic at the expense of Canadians who have suffered so much during this crisis? Will the liberals be honest for once or do we have to wait for the Auditor General to tell us? Well, the Auditor General <laughs> has been telling us, Mr. Speaker. Several investigations later, we land on to the SDTC scandal. And what a scandal it has become. Liberal connected insiders and cronies greasing their palms to the tunes of hundreds of millions of dollars without any thought of conflict of interest, without any thought that somehow uh, there was to be some measures put in place that would stop the fleecing of taxpayer dollars to the board of directors who were running SDTC. And, you know, I think, I think it's important that we remember again, uh, you know, what got us to this point, and that it was the Auditor General who found that the Prime Minister had turned sustainable development technology into a slush fund for in, in, liberal insiders. I remember being at the meeting where she presented her report and how she talked about the malfeasance that was going on within SDTC, the fact that there was very little oversight and a lo whole lot of conflict of interest going on. Now I remember, and I've heard some of the questioning that's been going on today from the, the Liberal side about uh, criminality. Well, it wasn't the Auditor General's task or role at the time, Mr. Speaker, to be looking into criminality. What she was looking for was how taxpayer dollars were landing in the hands of liberal insiders without any regard for conflict of interest rules. That's what she was looking for. And that's what she was reporting on. And that's what shed the light on the extent and the scope of this scandal that had started at the Ethics Committee almost a year earlier. The other thing that the Auditor General found that there was a recording of a senior civil servant who slammed the outright incompetence of the Trudeau, uh, of, the, of the government, and I apologize for that, of the government. 
uh, which gave out $390 million worth of contracts inappropriately. The whistleblower, the whistleblower was speaking about the very things that were going on. And I recall at Ethics Committee, uh, we had uh, Doug McConaughey there. And he had been recorded by the whistleblower. They were talking about this scandal. And even Doug McConaughey at that point was saying that this was on sponsorship level scandal. It was a sponsorship level scandal. Now the sponsorship scandal was $40 million, which is enough money. And then of course we all know what happened there. And it led to um, the, the, the Kretschian government being brought down. Uh, but this, Mr. Speaker, is upwards of $400 million. $400 million of taxpayer dollars that were being funneled to Liberal Connected insiders and cronies without any oversight. The Auditor General found that SDTC gave $58 million to 10 ineligible products, projects and that on occasions couldn't demonstrate an environmental benefit, not one environmental benefit, or development of green technologies. 334 million, over 186 cases, went to projects in which board members held a conflict of interest. I mean, it's unbelievable. And 58 million to projects without ensuing contribution agreement terms were met. Think of the coordinated effort that it takes among those board of directors and among the people that were involved in this to distribute that amount of money to what we now know in many, many cases were, co were companies that they had a financial interest in, Mr. Speaker. That doesn't border on criminal. I, there's nothing that does, quite frankly. The Auditor General also made it clear that the blame for this scandal falls on the Prime Minister's industry minister, who did not sufficiently monitor the contracts that were given to Liberal insiders. And uh, so it was common sense conservatives that really started the process of trying to get to the bottom of this. We had the industry minister in at ethics, um, and we had a report uh, that was done, an audit report, on this that we had asked for, we got it back and it had been redacted and then the Ethics, Commission, the Ethics Committee had asked that we get the report unredacted, that the report actually come to us and we did, finally, uh, after a lot of push-pull. But I think it's important at this point, Mr. Speaker, to really talk about why these oversight committees are so important to Parliament. The Standing Committee on Ethics, government operations and public accounts, the mighty OGA, as we like to, to say. It's important because these committees are uh, chaired by opposition members, and I've been the chair of ethics now for two years, and that's why I'm, I'm glad to speak on this because in my role as chair, as you know, Mr. Speaker, uh, there is a uh, level of neutrality that is required uh, in that role and that we have to, uh, we have to uh, make sure that uh, we're operating in a, in a neutral way, in a neutral function, uh, and giving a fair chance for all members. But these committees are run by the majority opposition members. And their intent is to hold the government to account. In the case of the Ethics Committee, uh, we deal with obviously ethics issues, and we, we've been dealing with a lot of ethics issues. Uh, I refer to it as the shooting the fish in a barrel committee uh, because of the amount of ethics uh, scandals that we've been dealing with, and I'll touch on those a little bit later. Uh, but OGO, the mighty OGO, dealing with government operations, contracts, uh, we found through OGO the Arrive Scam scandal and how that uh, played itself out, and of course public accounts. Uh, and this, quite frankly, this issue has been touching many, many committees, not just oversight committees that are led by the opposition. And so we have been trying uh, to do our job, our constitutional responsibility as His Majesty's loyal opposition, to get to the bottom of these many, many scandals that have been occurring, and we've been doing a very, very good job at that. Sometimes, uh, quite frankly, Mr. Speaker, uh, with some opposition from the opposition. Uh, we've not always had team players 
with other parties. Uh, we certainly saw that when the uh, coalition agreement was on with the NDP and the Liberals. Uh, the NDP would provide cover in many cases for motions that we were trying to pass in order to shed light on many of these scandals. Uh, we've seen uh, hopeful signs, I would call it, lately, that uh, they've backed away from that and that we are getting to the bottom of many of these scandals, not the least of which is the Who's Randy scandal that uh, the ethics and now this parliament are currently seized with. Um, so when we look back on SDTC and we look at what their mandate was, uh, they were a federally, and still are, a federally funded nonprofit that approve and disperses, uh, was supposed to, $100 million in fund, funds annually to clean technology companies. Uh, the key problems, of course, as I mentioned earlier, is that SDTC executives awarded projects in which they held conflicts over $330 million worth of taxpayer funds. And in 2019, former Liberal Industry Minister Navdeep Bains began removing conservative executives on SDTC when there weren't any scandals in relation to the fund and started replacing them with Liberal appointed executives. And the Prime Minister's newly appointed board began voting uh, companies in which executives hold active conflict of interest in SDTC funding. Governor's standards at the fund re deteriorated rapidly under the leadership of uh, the new chair appointed by the Liberals, Annette Versturin, who we had at Ethics Committee, and the Auditor General, and both the Ethics Commissioner as well back in July initiated separate investigations after those whistleblowers came forward with allegations of financial mismanagement at the fund and the Auditor General's investigation, as I said, Mr. Speaker, found severe lapse in governance standards and it uncovered almost 400, 400 million dollars in funding that was awarded to projects that either should have been ineligible to receive funding or were awarded to projects in which board members were conflicted during that five-year audit period. Just incredible, incredible stuff, Mr. Speaker. So I wanted to, I wanted to talk about a little bit of history here, uh, and it's not just the STTC scandal um, that we should be focused on or that Canadians should be focused on. It's a myriad of other scandals as well. And as I said, as chair of the Ethics Committee, I've had a front row seat over these last two years to many of these scandals that have come forward. Uh, and I had a front row seat, uh, Mr. Speaker, when I was uh, opposition house leader under our interim leader, Candace Bergen. And it was at that time that we were started, we were really dealing with the Winnipeg lab document scandal. The fact that uh, the government had, uh, had not provided documents that were asked by parliament. Uh, in fact, dug their heels in so much that they actually took the speaker to court to prevent these documents from being released. And we've seen a very similar situation here. There was nothing in the order by Parliament. And Mr. Speaker, Parliament is supreme. When committees ask for documents, there is an obligation on behalf of the government to provide those documents. And if they're asked for in an unredacted manner, there is an obligation because of the supremacy of Parliament to provide those documents unredacted. That wasn't the case here with the SDTC scandal. And when I go back to the Winnipeg Lab scandal, almost exactly the same thing happened. These documents were not provided for. What did they have to hide? What do they have to hide? Who's connected? Who is further connected? to this SDTC scandal that this government doesn't want us to understand or know. And why would they not want the potential criminality to be exposed in this scandal? And these are questions that the government is going to have to answer. And their members are going to have to answer when and if we do get to an election. But it wasn't just Winnipeg Labs. It wasn't just SDTC. It was the Arrive scam. Scandal. Again, $60 million plus given to Liberal Connected insiders for the Arrive scam application. And again, no answers, pushed back. We had to call Mr. Firth to the bar. Again, proving the supremacy of, of Parliament and the fact that we are the arbiters of what we need to determine and what we need to get to the bottom of. 
There was also um, the Trudeau Foundation that we've been dealing with at the Ethics Committee. We've been dealing with foreign interference at the Ethics Committee. Oversight committees intended to hold the government to account. Whether the government likes it or not, that is our constitutional role. As it's our constitutional role as His Majesty's loyal opposition to push and fight and make sure that government is, is on the up and up and that taxpayer dollars, that we are the stewards of taxpayer dollars. And we will continue to do that. And now we're dealing with another situation, as I said earlier, Mr. Speaker, that Parliament is now seized with and the ruling of the Speaker uh, on the point of privilege that was brought up uh, by the member from Thousand Islands, Rideau Lakes. You're going to help me out with this? Leeds, Grenville, Thousand Island, Rideau Lakes. You think I would know that by now because we sit on, uh, on the Ethics Committee together. But uh, we're dealing with uh, another question of privilege that I'm sure this House will be seized with over the next few days uh, that are coming uh, on, the, uh, on the Who's Randy scandal. And the fact that uh, the Minister was, um, was uh, seemingly operating his business while he was a minister. Uh, the conflict of interest in that is, is palpable, Mr. Speaker. The illegality of that is, is uh, real, uh, and we need answers to that. And back in July, uh, the Ethics Committee had a meeting. Uh, we had requested documents from a uh, witness, Mr. Anderson, who failed to provide those documents to the committee. And we gave him a timeline. This is when we need them by. And he failed to provide the information that was requested. And again, asserting ourselves and the supremacy of not just the committee but Parliament, uh, I reported to the House uh, what had happened, as was the committee's uh, wish, Mr. Speaker. And then uh, the member rose on a, a question of privilege and the fact that the privileges of the committee and the privileges of its members were not uh, adhered to by Mr. Anderson, and the Speaker ruled that the question of privilege uh, is now before the House, and uh, the motion has been duly moved, and it's a motion that we'll be debating uh, likely over the next couple of days, perhaps even into next week. Uh, and the part of that motion is to have Mr. Anderson come to the House, come before the bar, to be admonished by the Speaker, but more importantly, answer the questions that parliamentarians have been asking for, him for. And that's our job, not just on ethics, but on the mighty Ogo, and of course, public accounts as well, Mr. Speaker. And it all goes back, and I know you've heard this a couple of times, it all goes back to 2015, when this Prime Minister stood up before Canadians and said that they will be transparent and open by default. In fact, it was in the throne speech of 2015. In all of the examples that I've been citing uh, over the last few minutes, Mr. Speaker, proves that this is a government that has not been transparent and accountable and open by default. In fact, they've been anything but. And I look, part of our responsibility on the Ethics Committee is to deal, Mr. Speaker, with uh, access to information. And I would suggest to you, and we issued a report on access to information a few months back after studying it and having experts come in, members from the media uh, who have uh, been involved in the access to information system, and it is broken, Mr. Speaker. Oftentimes, the wait time for access to information documents are months, if not years. Information comes that's redacted. That's not open and transparent and accountable by default. That's anything but, Mr. Speaker. So, as I conclude, it's not just the system that's broken in this country in many ways. The affordability system, housing, the fact that young people are, you know, they've lost hope. They're despondent now of, of a prosperous future for themselves. The division that this Prime Minister has sown in this country along regional lines, race lines, faith lines, pitting neighbor against neighbor, all these things are broken. And the worst part about what's going on right now is not only have we got a de decline in democracy as a result of this government not being open and transparent and accountable by default, 
but it really speaks to the diminishment of our institutions and the ability of Parliament to ask for the information that it requires in order to protect the people of this country and to protect their money. And so, Mr. Speaker, I'll conclude by saying this, that I am extremely disappointed that we are on this, this path uh, once again and that the only thing that's going to change this is a change of government, a common-sense conservative government. Hopefully that happens soon. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Questions and comments, uh, Kissy Wonder, the Honourable Parliamentary Secretary of Government House Leader. Yes, uh, Mr. Speaker, the member from Brampton Brant says, what we're doing is we are assisting the RCMP. The question I have for the member opposite, how many times did the Conservative Party assist the RCMP when it came to the Conservative corruption dealing with anti-terrorism, as one pointed out, the Phoenix scandal, uh, the G8 spending scandal, the ETS scandal, the F-35 scandal, the Senate scandal, all of which were Conservative scandals. Now, I know there's probably another 30 or 40 that I'm missing, but Let's talk about today. The member made reference to foreign interference. What about the foreign interference in the Conservative leadership that enabled the current leader of the Conservative Party? Should we be getting the RCMP some documents or, uh, or looking to support or to, how does the member from Bradford Brant say? We should be assisting our RCMP dealing with that corruption in the Conservative leadership? The Honourable Member for Barry Ennisville. Well, I think that if, if there had been any evidence of that, Mr. Speaker, we certainly would see that playing itself out. What we have seen evidence, what we have seen evidence of is foreign interference on the part of this Liberal government. We've seen a Prime Minister who was informed many, many times, in fact, and the foreign interference inquiry is just shedding a light on that uh, this week, uh, a Prime Minister that was told about the foreign interference uh, situation that was going on and how many of his members were involved in this. So if this member wants to shed a light on foreign interference, yeah. I would suggest to him that we name the 11. We name them yeah. in this place who were involved with foreign interference. I, would, I think that would be a terrific start. You know, I was sitting there the other day, I met with, uh, with the commissioner of, uh, one of the commissioners of the European Union, and we agreed, we both agreed, that the only way to deal with foreign interference is to shed a light on it so that we're not looking at each other, so that we're not casting, casting suspicion on each other. Name those 11 MPs that were complicit to foreign interfer interference, Mr. Speaker, and this country will be in a better position as a result to deal with it. The Honourable Member for Rimouski, Nejet Temiskwatali Basque. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. I heard my colleague's speech from Barry Innisfield, who's putting the blame on the government uh, in terms of uh, transparency. But, Mr. Speaker, I'd like to remind my colleague that Quebec's uh, slogan, I remember, and I'd like to remind my colleague in 2010 during the G8 summit, the former conservative minister was accused of 50 million in corruption, Mr. Clements, for an infrastructure project in his writing. So, what did we learn from the AG? office in 2011, the government did not clearly or transparently say what the object, the request for financing was. Another excerpt from the office of the AG. During my career as an AG, I have never seen a situation like this one, when there was absolutely no documentation behind this. So my question for my colleague is simple. How can a party like the Conservative Party, who wants to form the next government, how can they ensure that Quebecers and Canadians can absolutely give them their trust with such a poor track record in terms of transparency and management of public funds? The Honourable Member for Barry. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. And I remember as well all the scambles from the Liberal Party in 2015. Almost immediately with the Aga Khan scandal. Look, we can, we can look into history all we want, Mr. Speaker, but the reality is that we've had nine years, nine years of a government who said they were going to be different, they were going to be open and transparent and accountable by default. You know, sunshine is the best disinfectant, sunny ways. I remember it all, all with his hand over his heart. And what have we got? Scandal after scandal after scandal, a divided country along all those lines that I talked about earlier. We've got 
uh, debt and deficit. We've got a young generation of people who have lost hope in this country. We need to restore the promise of Canada, and that's precisely what Canada's conservatives, common sense conservatives, are going to do, including upholding ethical standards. And if he wants any evidence of that, just look at the member from Thousand I Leeds, Grenville, Thousand I Islands, Rideau Lake. Look at the bill that he's proposed and support that as a start and a signal to what our, our intention is going to be in the next government. Thank you. Questions and comments? Uh, the Honourable Member for Vancouver, Kingsway. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Well, I note that the, uh, the motion under debate has to do with the failure of government to produce documents. And uh, I also share my, my colleagues' uh, commitment to accountability and the, the doctrine that Parliament is supreme. Um, but I was in the House in 2011 when former Speaker Milliken found the Conservative government in contempt of Parliament for refusing to hand over documents, just like this motion is calling for, uh, that would have revealed to Parliament the costs of corporate tax cuts, the criminal justice uh, measures that were being uh, debated, and the F-35 program. So I'm wondering, uh, to my honourable colleague, uh, on the principle that the best indication of future performance is past behaviour, would a future Conservative government, uh, would they commit to be different than the last Conservative government was when they refused to produce documents when Parliament, through majority vote, demanded them? Well, Member Barry Innesville. Thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker. And, uh, you know, some of the debate that I'm hearing today, I think the Honourable Members need to get back into a DeLorean and, uh, you know, try to be like Marty McFly and go back to the future. We're talking about, we're talking about scandals that have been seized, uh, that are seizing this Parliament right now involving this Liberal government, not the least of which is a $400 million scandal. And if the NDP would stop propping up this government, maybe, just maybe, we might get to the bottom of this. And better yet, let's have an election so that we can prove to Canadians that we are going to be a much better government, a much better common sense government than this Liberal government has been over the last nine years and not cause the despair and the misery that is facing our nation right now and let us prove to Canadians what good government is all about. Questions and comments? Uh, the Honourable Member for Chatham, Kent Lewington. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and thank you, my colleague from Barry Innisfil, for a very clear delineation. I'm going to crawl into the DeLorean for a moment. Let's go back. We've had a number of references to the sponsorship scandal as a kind of as a marker, as a comparator. And if I recall, a quote from that era from a former Liberal cabinet minister, David Dingwall, who stated, "I'm entitled to my entitlements." Is that what's going on here? To my honourable colleague, is this has now been extended to the government appointees, not only just to cabinet ministers and prime ministers? The honourable member for Barry Innisfil. Uh, loaded question, softball question. <laughs> Hit it out of the park. I know we're in the major league playoffs here, but uh, I, the the uh, it, it's I, I don't know what it is with these guys. I like. It, it's got to be in their DNA because we we've seen scandal after scandal that's come up where liberal connected insiders and cronies uh, have benefited as a result of these rela the relationships that they have with this liberal government. And I, I mentioned a few of them off the top. Uh, probably uh, one of the most absurd ones was former MP Frank Bayliss getting a sole source contract for hundreds of millions of dollars for ventilators that weren't even used. Sole source contract means that they didn't go and, and, and vet that out to anybody else or put it out for other bids. They gave it to liberal connected insiders. And we've seen these palms being greased since the beginning of this government. We saw it with the Prime Minister setting the example with his trip, the ethical violation to the Aga Khan's island. And I think it's in their DNA. I think they can't help themselves, Mr. Speaker, when it comes to breaching ethical scandal, breaching ethics laws and code of conduct uh, laws in this country. Um, they just can't help themselves, and this is why we're seeing it. And when that example is set at the top, it disseminates itself throughout the entire organization. In this case, it's disseminated itself throughout the entire part of government, and this is why we're dealing with these scandals, and it is impacting and affecting a decline in our democracy, trust in our institutions by Canadians, and we have to restore that trust, and the only way we can do it is to replace this tired, corrupt government with a uh, common-sense conservative government. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Quick question, the Honourable Member for Lac saint louis If we talked about the DeLorean again um, from 
67 to today, there's been many scandals, either it's the Liberals or the Conservatives. But let's go back now to October 2nd, 2004. My question is very simple, Mr. Speaker. Through you, why, in his opinion, what is the main reason that pushes the government to not produce the documents that have been requested today? The Honourable Member for Barry Innisfil. Fifteen seconds. I think because this goes much deeper than what is on the surface. I think there are much more people implicated that are connected to this government um, that are guilty of being complicit to what went on. And I think the government is afraid of the information being released and the impact that this is going to have, not just politically, but criminally as well. Thank you. Reprise.